Hello everybody, this is Amy from Chateau de Rosières and in today's 10 minute chateau tour Mark and I are going to be showing you the biggest room in the house. It's got a fascinating history and I'm going to be telling you a bit about some extra history that we'll be putting into it, bringing it over from England. I hope you enjoy it. I am here on the second floor of the house in a big room that's situated just next to the tower where we found the forbidden book. This room is extremely interesting because it spreads over two floors and it was walled all the way up to the roof. So when we first arrived we were wondering what the purpose of this room would have been in the past and uh, Amy's dad did a lot of research into it and we found that the most likely purpose would have been a silk weaving room. Silk was a very big cash crop in the area in the 18th and 19th centuries because we are so close to Lyon where there were major silk weaving factories at the time. Farmers would add on the silk to what they were already doing to get, uh, to get more income and a lot of old barns were converted into manianeries, which are silk weaving rooms. Silk is grown from the cocoon of a larva, of a moth larva, that feeds on mulberry leaves. Mulberry is a tree that grows really easily in the area and that's why it became quite a popular crop. You need a warm-ish environment, um, so it has to be done indoors, and you need quite a lot of space, because when you harvest the cocoon, you need to disentangle the silk, and you need a lot of space to, to spread the silk across a big room. Also, you need light coming from the top uh, in order to see what you're doing with the with very thin uh, threads. You also need to be able to bring easily bales in and out of the room. And in this room we have the evidence for all of that. So first the shelves are where the, the branches of mulberry would, uh, would be laid with the silkworms eating the leaves. Secondly, the window in front of me used to be a door in the past as we can see from the outside. So even though we were on the second floor of the house, it would have been really easy to carry big bales of mulberry branches using this wheel which is the, the rest of a winch that would have been used to, to pull a rope and uh, carry the, the big bales all the way through the door from the ground floor. The final piece of evidence is that we have on the, the estate several mulberry trees that are probably descendants of the ones that were used for growing uh, silk in the 18th and 19th century. So they, we only have now seedlings, we don't have very big trees, but the very fact that we find these trees which are not an indigenous species in the area points towards the fact that they used to be grown in the past. When we first came to Rosières, we weren't actually planning to visit this, but we came because of another chateau that had the most wonderful library, 18th century style with the silk on the walls, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful gallery over two floors as well. And it's the only thing we were really sad about in this place is that this one didn't have such a nice library. And we thought the, actually the volume of this room would make a very spectacular library 
as the we both dreamt of. We would really like to achieve uh, something with a similar feeling in this room, with a big gallery across the room, shelves all over the wall, and a staircase to to get to the the gallery. Amy is going to tell you more about this. I hope you enjoyed that tour of our old silk weaving room and future library and it's now my turn to tell you a bit about the history of a piece of furniture that we're going to be putting into that room which is a spiral staircase to take you from the bottom of the library up to the top gallery of the library and it comes from the UK and it has a very interesting history and to show you it I have to take you outside to the barn. And here we are in the barn, which will one day be our yoga studio, but currently is a furniture store. You can see there's lots and lots of treasures. And over here is the base plate of the spiral staircase. And dismantled in the corner, you can see the rest of it. It's a bit hard to imagine what it's going to look like. You can climb over here. <laughs> but do you see this this is one of the steps of it and these are the railings all up the side here now you might be wondering why we want to put such a plain metallic utilitarian staircase into a beautiful 18th century bibliotheque in a medieval chateau and the reason is because it's got an incredible history and for us the interest and the past and the history of objects is just as fascinating as um, how they look. This spiral staircase came from an airship station in the UK not far from where I grew up in Norfolk uh, a place called Pullum St Mary and we got it at an auction in Dis which has a fantastic auction house and we bought plenty of things from there before um, and we just couldn't resist it when we saw uh, it listed as an airship station spiral staircase and at that point we really didn't actually even know what we were going to use it for uh, but we went for it and we got it I'm not sure many people have a great use for um, a airship station spiral staircase so there wasn't a huge amount of competition um, so I thought today I might tell you a little bit about the history of the airships in this area in the UK I know it's not our French chateau but I find it really interesting and it's going to be the future of our chateau in the early 20th century aeroplanes couldn't really carry many people uh, they could fly quite long distances, but only with a handful of passengers. And so airships were used to carry hundreds of people at really long distances. They were great gas filled balloons with gondolas underneath. And they were so large that they could have dining rooms, bedrooms, all sorts of things and a separate driving gondola there. And they really boomed in the early 20th century. And it wasn't just for passenger flights, it was also for war. Uh, they were able to be to able to carry bombs and drop them on submarines in the North Sea and drop parachutists. And it was actually this proximity to the North Sea that meant that Pullum St Mary was chosen as an airship station in uh, 1916, where it was actually chosen just before the war. And then it was finally built and operational in 1916. The airships in Pullum St Mary came to be known as Pullum Pigs and there's a funny story attached to that. Apparently it was because a local farmer looked up in the sky when he saw one for the first time and said that looked like a great old pig that do. Once it was up and running in 1916 uh, it was run by, well, helped to be run by most of the village 
because the way it would land was they would uh, sound a siren when there was an airship coming in and then half the village would just peg it onto the runway jump up and grab a rope because it took so many people to bring one of these things to a standstill and take it down to the ground and apparently it was quite well paid work but a tiny bit dangerous because it had a tendency to take off with people hanging off the ropes and so the airship station at Pullum was used throughout World War I, uh, dropping bombs on submarines, parachute practice, all sorts of things. But it did continue to be used after the war. And it's a flight that took place in 1919 that we find particularly interesting and inspiring. Um, there was a very famous airship that flew out of Pullum at St Mary, and it was called the R-34. And it's famous because it made the first two-way trip to the US, the first two-way Atlantic crossing in 1919. And it took off from near Edinburgh, flew across to New York, landed, spent three days there, and then flew back and landed in Pullum. And actual time in the air was, let me get this right, seven days, 15 hours and 15 minutes. funniest story attached to this is that once they reached New York somebody had to parachute out of the airship to the ground to tell the ground staff how to land one of these things because they hadn't done it before. Anyway so this trip took just over seven days and a very uh, sweet thing is that in 1979 uh, on the 60th anniversary of that trip Concorde did the same route. It flew from Edinburgh to New York and back to Norfolk and that time it took the jet six hours and 59 minutes and I just find it incredible that in 60 years such a phenomenal change in technology happened that goes from over seven days to seven hours to do the same trip and our little staircase is part of that history it's part of uh, the huge change that happened in the 20th century and even though it doesn't look terribly pretty we're so proud to have that coming into our library and into the new and future history of Rosier.